Thank you, Jill, for that introduction. Our starting point this evening is that over the past two decades, metal detector finds have absolutely transformed our understanding of settlement and economic landscapes in early and middle Anglo-Saxon England. That is the period of the 5th to the 8th centuries AD. Now, this is due in very large part to the reporting framework established in the 1990s through the Treasure Act and the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Now, metal detecting has revealed many new sites and it's massively expanded our corpus of coins and metalwork, meaning that we now have data that are far more representative of real densities of human activity and settlement in the past and of real patterns of production, use, circulation and loss of artefacts. Having said that, of course, irresponsible metal detector use continues to represent a serious threat to the archaeological heritage. And the site we're talking about this evening exemplifies this in that it illustrates the impact, the threats and the potential of metal detecting, as well as being of major significance in its own right. And we've chosen this title image because, as will become clear during our talk, we owe really so much of what we know about Rendlesham to these guys, the metal detectorists who undertook the survey. So we're going to present the background to the survey at Rendlesham, the methods we're using, some key results, some current thoughts on interpretation, and some of the broader questions that all this raises. We have to stress that this is work in progress, and what we're sharing, therefore, is interim reporting. And we apologise if this feels sometimes like a bit of a tease. There's a lot that we don't yet know, or can't usefully speculate about, although that is not going to stop me speculating. And some areas <coughs> there are where we're not at limited liberty to, spe sorry, to share sensitive details or to share other people's provisional thinking. But nonetheless, we hope that what we have to present to you tonight will be of interest. Um, so having said that, I'd like to hand over to Jude to start off by introducing the project and introducing the pre-Saxon archaeology. Thank you, Chris. I'll start by locating Rendlesham for you in the southeast corner of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of East Anglia. Much of this area has very sandy soils with large areas of dry heathland in the interfluvial regions, but with more mixed soils to the west and in the valleys. For some time, we have recognised this, is a core this is a, as a core area of the emerging kingdom in the late 6th and 7th centuries, with so-called productive sites in the Gipping Valley at Coddenham and Barham, the Royal Cemetery at Sutton Hoo on the Deben Estuary, and the port and town at Ipswich. Rendlesham has historically been identified as a significant place because it is, a, it is mentioned by Bede, writing in the 720s, as a vicus regius, a royal settlement, associated with an East Anglian king, Ethelwald, and the baptism of the East Saxon, Swithon, in around 660. This inevitably coloured antiquarian and archaeological records particularly in the 20th century after the discovery of the Sutton Hoo ship burial some four miles away. Explorations by Basil Brown and Rupert Bruce Mitford in the 1950s were unproductive and rather confused the issue as to where exactly a royal site might be located. But as part of the survey associated with the 1980s excavations at Sutton Hoo, the County Council Archaeological Service field walked land near the church and near Naunton Hall and found handmade pottery and Ipswich ware. At this time, we also excavated the footprint of a new barn at Naunton Hall and found middle and late Anglo Saxon ditches and a couple of fragments of Anglo Saxon metalwork. This confirmed that a settlement existed at this end of the parish, but not what its status might be. The current project began following concern from the Norton Hall landowner about nighttime looting from his fields. After discussion with him, our initial project involved a small metal detecting and magnetometry survey and an assessment and digitisation of the existing records. It rapidly became apparent that the Anglo-Saxon complex was larger than expected and that the finds included indicators of high status such as Merovingian premises. Also, criminals were clearly attacking the sites regularly immediately after ploughing. Collaboratively, a new approach was put together whereby the metal detecting was expanded to cover the whole Norton Hall estate 
under a private agreement between the detectress and the owner, but still applying the archaeological principles of systematic coverage, handheld GPS recording of locations, recovery of visible finds, and notes on soil conditions. The archaeological service would then record the finds to portable antiquity scheme standards on a standalone database and GIS. As a result, we have benefited from about 170 man days of high quality metal detecting survey each year, which simply would not have been affordable in any other system that we could think of. <coughs> This was not an attempt to somehow sterilise the site to avoid criminal damage. The intention was to obtain a good representative sample of the plough soil material and in the process deter the criminals who have actually become very much less in evidence since the second year of the survey. We hope that there may be benefits in looking at using this approach elsewhere. Magnetometry also proved successful in the first season and was extended through the main Anglo-Saxon areas. This provided a good basis for small-scale testing of the below plough soil archaeology by excavation during 2013. As you can see, the estate provides a 2.25 kilometre sample along the east bank of the Deben Valley from the low-lying water meadow water meadows in the valley, up the sides and onto flat higher ground. Although sandy soils predominate, there are areas of clay and the combination would have provided a better basis for mixed farming in the past than, for example, in the area immediately surrounding Sutton Hoo. In the core area, there is a strong promontory defined by a minor stream to the north that overlooks the Deben. And this, the Deben may well have actually been navigable to this part of the county, with no way of knowing at the moment. Both the hall and the medieval church are settled, sited on this promontory. I'm now going to look quickly at very preliminary results from the survey and the subsequent evaluation for the Iron Age and Roman periods as background to the meaty stuff that Chris will then cover. Of course, when we examine the finds of any period in a plough soil assemblage, there are questions about how the objects arrived there and about the impact of recent agricultural practices on the objects and on any underlying archaeological deposits. This project is providing a substantial and well-recorded sample for research on these topics. Looking at the broad distribution of Roman material, we can isolate three potential separate areas of activity, only two of which so far include a few late Iron Age pieces. Those are the almost invisible pink spots amongst the mass of blue spots. The low level of identifiable Iron Age objects is not very surprising. Of 56,000 items from Suffolk recorded on the Port of Antiquity Scheme database, only 2,000 are Iron Age in date. The distribution of Iron Age objects also failed to indicate the date of one of the more prominent features in the magnetometry, a D-shaped enclosure which I spent some time comparing to various Anglo-Saxon sites but which on excavation last year produced early 1st century pottery. In the south of the survey area, one field has produced little other than a scattered hoard of denarii deposited in the 170s. This is a good demonstration of displacement in plough soil. It is highly probable that the 25 coins were deliberately buried in a container rather than dropped and lost on an original ground surface and that they have then been dispersed out after the plough struck the hoard feature, perhaps sometime in the, long, in the, first, long, uh, sometime in the 20th century. The first 10 denarii were found within metres of each other, but the total plot shows a scatter spreading over 200 metres to the north, with one stray 100 metres to the southwest. Those are the yellow spots on the insert. 
The other Roman finds from this field are a few fragments of 1st century brooches and a couple of illegible 3rd and 4th century coins, which could all be striped stray losses or even redeposited through manuring. To the north and west in the survey area, the Roman assemblages, which I've circled, are only partially catalogued, but so far the coin groups look very comparable to the norm for East Suffolk, where generally coin use declines after the middle of the 4th century. They have a typically rural profile of low coin use before the late 3rd century, and very few of them are silver. Something very different is found in the central areas. There is a good range of Roman material in the field that is at the heart of the 7th century Anglo-Saxon site, where we have already seen the late Iron Age enclosure. The identified sample of the coins shows that 50%, are roughly, were minted in the second half of the 4th century, whereas, as I say, the norm is for declining numbers at this point. And it includes an extraordinary number of the very late small bronze coins of the 390s and early 5th century. The possibility of a hoard of these has also been noted by the detectorists, and the spots in red on the insert are where the detectorists thought they were getting coins that might be grouped as from a hoard. Because of the unusual aspects of this group, we have enlisted help from our Portable Antiquities Scheme colleagues at the British Museum to look at the main bulk of the 260 coins from this specific area. <coughs> to the north, on the north side of the central area, there are a group of fields where the Roman assemblage will be exceptionally hard to interpret. At first glance, the coin group might be that of a settlement that is somewhat more prosperous than the average rural group, and that has a strong presence in the 4th century, including, again, the late 4th to early 5th. But even without the knowledge that there are early Anglo-Saxon finds suggesting burials, and that there are sunken featured buildings showing in the magnetometry, this coin group includes a strong element of reuse. Nearly 10% of the coins are pierced, and one has been modified with a row of punched circles. The percentage of silver coins is also high, in particular three late Roman siliquine. Uh, this is something like four times the average you would find on a Suffolk Roman site. There is undoubtedly evidence in the fields that comprise our Vicus Regius complex that also relates to questions about the processes of change between the late Roman and early Anglo-Saxon in the 4th and 5th centuries. Thank you for that, Jude. I'm now going to discuss the early medieval, that is the Anglo-Saxon material. I'm going to be concentrating on the period of the 5th to 8th centuries, but of course we have evidence here for continuous activity through to the 11th century and indeed up to the present day. And I want to start by reiterating the point that when we situate Rendlesham within its regional geopolitical context, it is argued that this part of South East Suffolk formed the core of the 7th century kingdom of the East Angles, or perhaps more properly the territorial focus of royal power in the 7th century, an area sometimes termed the Sandlings province. This shows the distribution of all finds of the 5th to 11th centuries within the survey area, which is of course indicated by the fields outlined in red and, and hatched, sorry, <coughs> and, and shaded. The majority of the finds are 5th to 8th century, but we've got 9th to 11th century activity attested by metalwork and pottery, and there is the main concentration which suggests activity over 40 to 50 hectares, and this concentration has material from the 5th century right through until the 11th. And our indications are that both settlement and burial take place here from the early to middle 5th century, and therefore taken with the latest culturally Roman material, they may indicate that there is no break in activity here from the later 4th century onwards. This is a selection of the material that we believe <coughs> indicates settlement or assemblies and gatherings at this place. 
In other words, material has been lost or discarded during everyday use. And it includes press accessories, as you can see, harness and weapon fittings, coins, almost certainly dropped during transactions, and tools such as, as this knife. Now, as Jude has said, there are a number of ways in which artefacts can come to be in the plough soil. And I just want to show two slides which illustrate very simply some of the complexities that we face in interpreting this. This first one shows the distribution of selected dress accessory types that might of the 5th and 6th centuries, female dress accessories, that might be lost or discarded, but which are also routinely buried with the dead as grave goods, and so which could either come from settlements or from burials. The broad background distribution here suggests perhaps settlement and manuring, but we have two strong concentrations ringed on the, <coughs> the plot, here and here, which suggest the locations, we think, of plough damaged cemeteries. By contrast, a selected range of dress accessories of the 7th to 9th centuries, which are almost certainly not dress accessories because they belong to types dating to a period after the abandonment of furnished burial, probably show us the distribution of settlement activity during this period. We have evidence for metalworking at the site in the 7th century, and we have the evidence of production for a social elite in the form of the recycling of precious metal. We have here gold scrap and melted down silver. We have metalworking debris in the form of globules of gold and silver and silver melt. We have unfinished objects such as this incomplete unfinished um, casting of a style to mount. And we have this lead model for a sword ring. This is the model from which the clay piece mould will be made, from which in turn the white metal or silver ring ornament itself will be manufactured that is then attached to the sword pommel. And we have evidence as well for the manufacture of lower value copper alloy items, such as these bag fittings, so called, seen here in their discarded failed form and their finished form, buckle loop and completed buckle pin and completed pin, and we have production debris such as the casting sprues discarded after the items are broken up in the moulds and a lot of melted copper alloy. Now these sorts of items we think are certainly being used by the community at Rendlesham because we have so many finished examples in the settlement assembly, but there are really quite large numbers of some items such as these bag fittings which are otherwise quite uncommon in the 7th century, they're uncommon 7th century types. And this raises a question as to whether there's production here that was serving a wider rural population. There is also a very strong, well, say a very strong concentration. There is a good concentration of production waste and failed castings in Parkfield here, which does suggest that we have a workshop area in this field. There is evidence for long distance contacts from the 6th century. Now, the presence in the early and middle 6th century of continental brooch types, such as those at the bottom of the slide, would normally be explained by their having moved with or on people, and would, would normally be taken as indicative of social contacts, and because these are things that move on women, female dress accessories, they'd often be taken as indicative of exogamy or exogamic contacts. The presence in the late 6th and 7th centuries of continental gold coinage, East Mediterranean cast bronze vessels, and hanging bowls from Celtic Britain, would normally be explained as a product of elite gift giving. But we also have the largest collection of Byzantine copper alloy coinage from a secure early medieval context in England. This is a tightly dated group, the late 6th to the early 7th centuries, identified by Sam Warhead at the British Museum, and it must have come with packages of trade goods of the sort that included the cast bronze vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean. If found in a Western British context, this would almost certainly be taken as evidence for direct mercantile contacts, and I see no reason to suppose otherwise because it's found in Eastern England. So we feel that we have not just socially embedded elite gift exchange here, but also a degree of directed mercantile trade. There are a lot of gold coins. There are a lot of coins and a lot of gold coins on the site, and the earlier phase of coin loss from the mid to late 6th century to the later 7th century is dominated by continental gold coinages. There are, of course, no Anglo-Saxon coins before the early 7th century, and there is, of course, a switch from a gold to a silver coinage in Francia and England 
around AD 670. Anyway, we have 25 early gold coins from the site, of which four are English. We also have 165 of the early silver pennies, known as shatters, and the point to make here is that the distribution of fines is similar. The shattered distribution intensifies and expands that of the distribution of the early gold fines. We're looking here at coin use and coin loss over the entire site. This is not something that can be explained as a disturbed hoard or hoards. And this is a large number of coins for a settlement site of this period, and there is an unusually high proportion of early gold, especially imported gold, as a proportion of the 6th to 8th century coin assemblage. And that can be illustrated by this side, slide, which shows the national background as culled from the early medieval coinage database, curated by the Fitzwilliam Museum, shown on the left, and our Grindelsham 6th to 8th century coin assemblage on the right, where you can see that both the proportion of early gold and the constituent elements of the early gold run at about twice the national average. And this suggests both that Rendlesham was a place to which precious metal flowed, and that gold coinage may actually have been circulating as money, rather than simply as precious metal, raw material for the jeweller, or as a form of portable iconography. And we have corroborative evidence for this, because we've got <coughs> coin weights marked with contemporary Byzantine denominations. We also have weight-adapted coins, such as this tremesis, which has had a quarter coin soldered to it. We have cut coins, i.e. a half monetary unit. We have blanks and ingots, which may well have been used, <coughs> valued by weight within the system, which use both coins and, and bullion. And we have evidence, possibly for counterfeiting, in the form of a silver gilt uh, copy of a contemporary tremesis. In other words, while it is generally accepted that the later silver shatter coinage indicates monetization from the later 7th century, we think our evidence here is that the earlier gold was also circulating as part of a currency system. Now, gold coinage encapsulates the link between the concentration of wealth and long-distance communication. These are contacts that can only be explained if this settlement served an elite social group. And the final confirmation that such a group was indeed living here from the early to middle 6th century, if not before, comes from high quality dress and harness fittings such as those shown on this slide. Here we are picking up on the ground at Rendlesham the detritus of the material culture circulating in an elite social milieu. These items were worn, used and occasionally lost at Rendlesham by the people who deliberately chose to bury them with their dead kin at places like Sutton Hoo. And I put this slide up to summarise the current consensus around the character and functions of higher status settlements, places like Yevering and Drayton, in England in the later 6th and 7th centuries. And our archaeological indications are that what we have does indeed tally with Rendlesham being an important central place from the 5th century at least, through to the 9th century, with a particular spike of activity from the 6th to the early 8th centuries. So we can envisage it as a taxation, administration and collection centre for an extensive agricultural or farming hinterland. We can think of it as well as a periodic elite or royal residence. And following from this, we can think of it as an assembly place, for example, for judicial and military gatherings, and we can think of it as a special sort of economic centre where luxury trade was directed towards a wealthy elite or to their agents. The only element we don't have from our survey is clear evidence for major buildings. But anyway, so much for theorising from surface finds and from survey data. That can only take you so far. In order to firm up our understanding of the site, we needed to test our thinking against the actual buried archaeology. And as Dude has indicated, we did this by opening six evaluation trenches last October. Our excavation methods and trench locations were carefully chosen to give us best information about the site and the condition of the archaeology as a whole from a small sample. And our detailed objectives <coughs> used, yeah, on which basis a number of organisations, including the site of Antiquaries, agreed to fund the exercise, are set out in this slide. Fundamentally, to characterise the subsurface archaeology as far as we could, to date key features that have been identified from the non-intrusive work, to evaluate the condition of the buried deposits, and to try and begin to investigate the derivation of the material that was being found on the surface and in the plough soil. 
The areas, exam the areas that we examined were selected as representative of broader terrains or suites of features. And the red rectangles in the inset show the, <coughs> excuse me, show the locations of our trenches. The trench locations were guided by geophysics. We excavated six <coughs> 10 by 5 metre trenches to investigate anomalies on the geophysics plot, characterise them, date them and assess their condition. It would be nicer to dig larger areas, it would be nicer to go for some blanks, but when you're working in this way, evaluatively, on a limited budget, we had to go for you know, the positive reinforcement by, by testing known, known features. In field 44, finds in geophysics suggested settlement and burial evidence and gatherings or assemblies, so that's why we went there. And field 13 had major ditches and enclosures, was within the area of the 1982 field walking, and had the densest concentration of finds, which is why we went there. Now, when you're trying to sell the importance of a site on the basis of what is in the plough soil rather than under the plough soil, if you're going to intervene, you have to make absolutely damn sure that you're not going to machine away everything that's actually in the plough soil. Um, so the way we approached this, so as to ensure we weren't losing material, and in order to allow us to calibrate our surface finds against what's actually in the plough soil, we initially dug 25% of each trench, the plough soil, 25% of each trench, <coughs> sorry, 25% of the plough soil in each trench by hand in 10 centimetre level spits with each spit metal detected and <coughs> all excavated soil sieved through a 10 millimetre mesh. Well, if we decided that we were not picking up enough by this retrieval method in the plough soil to justify carrying on to them by hand, we then removed the rest of the plough soil using a machine, <coughs> we stripped it by machine, but we removed it again in 10 centimetre spits and we metal detected each spit. For the excavated archaeological contexts underneath, we took whole earth samples, 40 litres for preference from all excavated contexts, and we sieved all excavated material that wasn't in a bulk uh, sample through a 10 millimetre mesh. And we took soil columns from all key cratographic sequences to investigate how and from what archaeological deposits, and <coughs> so from how and what the archaeological deposits had formed um, by using soil, soil morphology techniques. So we think that our recovery of artifactual, artifactual and environmental evidence from the site um, will be pretty good, has been pretty good. Uh, the results in Trench 2 in Field 44, our anomaly proved to be an Anglo-Saxon Brubenhaus sunken featured building with <coughs> which, which was then used in the late 5th or the earlier 6th centuries. And we know this because it had a lovely, tightly datable assemblage which included a very datable um, copper alloy small long brooch. To the east of this, in Trench 4, in the same field, the anomalies proved to be an Anglo-Saxon sunken featured building and an adjacent rubbish pit, in my view, in use sometime between the late 6th century and the early 8th century. And of course, when we're excavating these Brubenhäuser, what we're actually excavating are the below ground traces of a building that is constructed over and around a pit, like a small cellar dug into the ground. These are not dwelling houses, we think, but storage buildings or working <coughs> sheds. But where they are found, so there will almost always be larger ground level timber buildings whose foundations show only as post holes or foundation trenches, neither of which are easy to find with geophysics or with excavation unless you strip a large area. So the presence of Grubenhäuser here almost certainly <coughs> indicates further, larger ground level buildings, halls, dwelling houses, barns, and so forth. Our trench three, to so the north of the one I've just shown you, was located in an area where pottery and metal finds suggested burials. We only dug a small area of this trench, all by hand, because at the base of the plough soil, we found remains of Anglo-Saxon cremations which had been disturbed by ploughing. At that point, we lifted the disturbed cremations and backfilled the trench, because you do not start digging Anglo-Saxon cemeteries unless you've got a lot of money and backup. And so our conclusions about trench uh, field 44 are that there is a strong possibility, in fact I would say a virtual certainty, that the scatters of discrete anomalies, these many acne-like blobs, all over the area on the geophysics are settlement features of the fifth to eight centuries, that is, sunken feature buildings and pits, and that the entire field and beyond, at one time or another in this period, was a settlement area. And we can expect traces of timber halls here. Adjacent to this, there was a cemetery which certainly had cremations and where inhumations can be inferred from the finds in the plough soil. And the area also saw monetary transactions in gold and silver in the seventh and eighth centuries. In field 13, our trench 6 was located to find and test a major linear feature, 
principally to date it and to investigate the source of black material and animal bone in the plough soil. This is the ditch the linear feature we're interested in. It's got a, another one here, so there's a big ditch sequence and there's some others associated with it. There were two main options we were betting on, either 19th century agricultural boundaries or a cursus. We were very wrong. Beneath the plough soil, there was a thick black layer containing much animal bone and, pot and some pottery. It's a midden or a waste dump, apparently containing an enormous amount of food and butchery waste. Pottery and other finds indicate an er that it is early to middle Anglo-Saxon, and the preliminary analysis indicates that there's a high status consumption signature here. And this is important because at other middle Anglo-Saxon sites in the region, at Brandon, Wickham, Bonham, Bloodmore Hill, for example, these middens are close to the major buildings of the settlement. In other words, it's an indication that there are probably major buildings of the settlement quite close by. Under the midden layers and filled with the same material was a double ditch, also Anglo-Saxon, and also sealed by midden layers was a feature with late Roman pottery, which might be a late Roman pit, might be an Anglo-Saxon Roman house. We left it alone. We didn't go any further. So our conclusions for this field, field 13, are that we have prehistoric ring ditches, we have Iron Age enclosures, we have late Roman activity, this is after all where that late Roman possible hoard was found. Um, we have a major Anglo-Saxon, early to middle Anglo-Saxon, set of boundary ditches or troveways, and we have a large area of Anglo-Saxon waste deposit, midden dumps, which looks as though they're being dumped over a boundary and down the hill towards the river. So we are thinking that actually if there are major buildings, they're in this area, alas, under wood and landscaped garden. Back to the bigger picture. The evaluation tells us about the archaeology where we excavated, but it also allows us to be more confident about interpreting the other finds of geophysics in the fields where we didn't dig. So we can be fairly confident now that the geophysical results in this sort of area also indicate the same sort of settlement as we've got here. So we are better able to interpret the full extent of finds and survey data, and what then does this mean for our understanding of Rendlesham in the early to middle Anglo-Saxon periods? Well, this is how we're currently interpreting the layout of the central place complex, as we call it, at Rendlesham in the 6th to the 8th centuries. We've got a settled community, able to accumulate and disperse high-status material in precious metal from the 5th to the 8th centuries. There's evidence for long-distance overseas contacts in the 6th century, and from the later 6th century, if not before, there was access to the highest level social or economic networks at a European scale. At least some of the people here feasted copiously, drawing on the substantial resources of a farming hinterland, and they kept horses, hawks, and hounds. Rendlesham was undoubtedly an important place when the Sutton Hoof Cemetery was in use, and when Bede was writing 100 years later. There is clear evidence for social and economic centrality, and even without Bede's reference, the archaeology would lead us to say that this was a site at the apex of any social and economic hierarchy, and it would be a strong candidate for a royal centre. But what in turn does this tell us about what the Vicus Regius was, Bede's term? Well, it was extensive, if this is indeed it, 50 hectares, with different settlement and activity areas. It's a polyfocal complex which we may well find developed and changed over time. The wider scatter of coinage and metalwork probably, in our view, represents periodic activity as well as a permanent settlement presence. We have strong evidence from environmental remains and material culture items for an elite presence and for acquisition, consumption and display. We also have evidence for less exalted population, for monetary transactions and craft production. We do not think that this is primarily a market or a trading site, but it may periodically have served as such. The settlement embodied a range of functions and activities at different social and economic levels, and their relative emphases may have varied both periodically and over the longer term. And so our interpretation is that this was a farm and a residence and a tribute centre where the land's wealth was collected and, redi and redirected, and where major administrative payments were made and important social and jurisdictional events were transacted. It's at the apex of a system of surplus extraction and jurisdiction, and at the centre of the systems of consumption and redistribution and patronage that fueled elite social and political relationships at this time. Now, we believe that early medieval kings and magnates were peripatetic, moving between different establishments. We can therefore see Rendlesham as a permanent centre for agrarian or economic administration, but as periodically hosting other functions, such as, I'd say, military assemblies or assemblies for the transaction of justice. 
hosting these as and when the magnate or the king was in residence. The broader scatter of metalwork finds includes items such as harness and weapon, weapon fittings that are consistent with a high status social milieu and which might well be explained as the aggregate loss from years of periodic gatherings in the paddocks around the royal residence. So we can envisage the permanent population of the place augmented when the king and his household or retinue were in residence and swelling further when there were assemblies or other gatherings, the equivalent of a tent village once or twice a year for decades or for a century or more. And in that respect, given that we are arguing that things are dropping off people, and that's what we're finding, it would be quite interesting to do a metal detector survey, I think, of the Glastonbury um, Festival site, for example, where you have a similar periodic concentration. <laughs> now, we believe that coinage was used as currency at Rendlesham from some time in the 6th century. Conventional wisdom would emphasise social and jurisdictional contexts for transactions in gold, which was the elite currency of worth and reward. And I do wonder if any of the coins we have found were part of a donative on the occasion of Sir Thomas baptism. It would, though, be foolish, I think, to deny the possibility that commercial transactions might be represented in the earlier gold phases of coin use at Rendlesham. A permanent administrative function, periodic presence of a royal household, periodic assemblies of the social elite would all act as powerful magnets for directed trade and might very likely foster and sustain a market or fair, periodic market or fair. Something was given in return for Frankish gold and Byzantine imports, and products of a dominial farming and craft production surplus might be part of the answer. Now, conversely, the later and lower value silver coins are usually seen as indicative of an increasingly monetized market economy. But by the same token, I think we have to envisage their use also in jurisdictional and administrative payments. Now, these show Rendlesham and Ipswich in the 7th and 9th centuries at the same scale. The area of activity at Rendlesham is as large as the contemporary trading settlement at Ipswich at its greatest extent. It is indeed substantially larger than 7th century Ipswich. So 7th century Rendlesham is about three times as large as 7th century Ipswich, as far as we can tell. The material culture signature, though, is very different. Ipswich has imported pottery, but Rendlesham has little or none. Ipswich, though, lacks the early coinage, the material wealth, and the elite metalwork that we see at Rendlesham. Now, the conventional explanation of productive sites, so-called, in the hinterlands of Emporia, such as Ipswich, is that they represent inland markets. And this has been suggested, for example, for Cottenham, northwest of Ipswich, in the Gipping Valley. <coughs> to me, this doesn't really work, and at best, I think it can only be a small part of the explanation for the archaeology of the 8th century and later. These, to me, are sites that are integrated into a monetizing or monetized economy rather than market sites. Codnam in the 7th century appears in many ways to be similar to Rendlesham. It appears to be an important settlement with a strong consumption and display signature. Now, interestingly, there is evidence of a decline in monetary usage wider to the, relative to the wider regional and national picture at Rendlesham and, and Codnam after around 720, which is the time when Ipswich is expanding as an international port and as a major manufacturing centre. And this poses a few interesting questions. Is it the case that before this, that is in the late 6th and 7th centuries, there was some centralising of economic functions, including craft production and supply, around major rural magnate residences or estate centres? In which case, was Ipswich in the 7th century literally only a gateway community, a foreign traders' enclave with real exchange, real luxury exchange certainly, being directed towards magnate centres and the transactions actually taking place at magnate centres? And was there, with the upsurge in international trade and the monetary economy from around 680 to 700, a decisive shift towards integrating trade and production at port sites, coastal port sites, at the expense of developing rural centres? There is evidence for all these things, I think, from South East Suffolk, and they would run counter to current thinking on rather simple trajectories of urban development, which would privilege the Wicks or Emporia in this early stage. Now, the persistence of activity and importance at Rendlesham is significant. There may have been some change in functional zoning and activity areas, but the focus of the surface material, and so we can surmise that of settlement activity, remains remarkably consistent within the immediate locality for at least 300 years from the middle of the 5th century, if not earlier. Now, it's thought that there were major reorganisations of the landscape in the late 6th and 7th centuries associated with the emergence of the regional kingdom structure. If so, then Rendlesham was a fixed element of the landscape around which such changes occurred. 
And this would appear to run counter to the influential proposition that organisational or administrative stability was introduced by and was exclusive to the Anglo-Saxon church. And this in turn argues for a greater continuity and stability of administrative arrangements and local power structures than has sometimes been envisaged for this period. Rendlesham is also something new in the archaeology of the early Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. It's a long-lived central place complex. Now, such sites are known in Sweden and Denmark at this time, but have not yet, before this, been recognised elsewhere in England. But I think that Rendlesham also needs to be seen against economic and political geographies of the Near Channel and Northern Francia and the North Sea, and in particular, the contemporary emergence of polyfocal central places in Northern Francia. So the archaeology at Rendlesham has an international as well as a national importance in that it is being to pull our understanding of 7th century England, or certainly this part of 7th century England, more forcibly into the broader European picture. Now, it's one of a handful of high-status sites of the early and middle Anglo-Saxon periods which can be securely identified in contemporary documentary sources, and is the only one of this small group which there's such abundant, sensitive and precise material culture data. At Yevering in Northumberland, for example, we famously have the excavated buildings, but virtually no finds. Consequently, there is high potential here to establish the cultural signature of a 7th century Vicus Regius and to elucidate its spatial organisation and social and economic character. And because its status is documented, and we actually have in the ground the material culture assemblage associated with the period for which its, <coughs> its status is documented, we have potential here to calibrate other sites, known primarily from surface finds, power soil assemblages or so-called productive sites, to calibrate these against Rendlesham as some form of tentative social and economic benchmark. And because all periods, from prehistory to the modern, are represented in the archaeology at Rendlesham, there is tremendous potential here to examine not only how settlement and activity changed across the periods or the emergence of the documented East Anglian Kingdom, but also to put this into a much longer sequence of development. So, We've identified a long-lived polyfocal central place that is an order of magnitude larger than most other known contemporary rural settlements, that shows an unexpectedly early and sophisticated degree of monetary circulation and integration with long-distance exchange networks, which in turn implies enduring and robust economic and administrative geographies that underpin social hierarchy and elite consumption, and a site that may show signs of early centralising craft production. This presents a series of challenges to received views of economy and society in South East England in the 6th and 7th centuries. We don't by any means have all the answers to the questions that this site is posing, but we're going to have an awful lot of fun over the next few years trying to answer them. Now, as we've said, the project is still underway. Our next steps over the coming year are fundamentally to complete a formal assessment of the evaluation and proceed to analysis to publication to pull together the management implications of our results and develop a programme of analysis for the research and publication for the product, project as a whole. As Jude has mentioned, <coughs> there is an exhibition at the National Trust Visitor Centre at Sutton Hoo and a chance to see a selection of finds from Rendlesham, um, which closes its final weekend is the 1st and 2nd of November um, this year. And then finally, the point which we must make is this is a collaborative effort and we have to acknowledge with thanks everyone who's been involved. In particular, Roy Allen, Rob and Terry for the Metal Detecting Survey, Faye Minter, our colleague in managing and running the project, who's done the finds coordination, the landowner and their farmer, and the farmer for their active support and encouragement, which is not always forthcoming in other cases, all the funding bodies and organisations that have given support, and the many colleagues who have given their time to the project at no cost or as volunteers because they recognise the importance of the archaeology. This is their work. There's still a lot to do, and our interpretations will, of course, develop as work proceeds, but we are confident about the outline we've presented here tonight, and we're confident about the importance of the archaeology of Rendlesham. Thank you for your attention.
mud answering at the end. Is that something? Yes, that's, 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 that's the that standard thing? way, yeah. <laughs> and I believe it was a roving mic as well. So. Do I have any questions? I can't Justin. You've shown us some evidence for non ferrous metal working, which is most interesting, certainly for the Saxon period, because there's relatively little known, especially for the earlier theories. I was wondering if there was any evidence for iron working. I know that those fines aren't as easily. see um, this model which I put up with an elephant trap which nobody here has fallen into which is the cult center that is the church because every migration period complex central place complex has to have a cult center sorry I'm not answering aren't I? Yes. apologies I'll come back to that <coughs> I, I do I do I do apologize for that. <laughs> like enthusiasm um, John <coughs> this is going to be sorry, am I on? There. Um, one of the awful things where one wants to sort of make a point and tries to put it into the form of a question. Um, in fact, as I look across the range of material here, what stands out for me as most unusual is perhaps relatively humble. It's not the bank fittings, but it is a collection of Byzantine um, bronze coins. Um, that have come up from here. They are, as you said, familiar in the, in the west of Britain. To the best of my knowledge, they are very unusual indeed, if not unique, on um, Anglo-Saxon sites. So I would be interested to um, hear how far your research has gone into uh, looking for parallels to their presence on Anglo-Saxon sites. Um, and really to ask you to think more about the um, the degree to which they can be fitted into a model of, of a monetized site. These would be very, very small change indeed compared to the silver and gold um, that is otherwise being used there, I would have thought. Justine, we as yet have no evidence for ferrous metal working. Um, we do have <coughs> bulk samples which are being screened and tested for every sort of environmental and artifactual evidence. We do not yet have any evidence for <coughs> smithing or other forms of ferrous metal working on the site. I would expect to find it if we dug the entire 50 hectares, it's there somewhere. But as yet, we don't have it. Leslie, the, the church, I started off the church. It sits within the scatter of 5th to 8th century metalworking, so 5th to 8th century material culture. It's pretty much on the edges of the real central core of what we think the activity in settlement area is. It is a 13th to 14th century building, and there is no record of there being an earlier church on the site. But the fact of the dedication and the fact that it is close to a major Middle Saxon <coughs> site does suggest that there ought to be... So it is very credible that there is something much earlier there. Everybody says to us, look around the church, you need to look more around the church. We have, actually. We've looked around the church, we've better looked around the church, we've surveyed around the church, we've magnetometered around the church. <coughs> nothing. Or nothing out of the ordinary. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it raises a lot of questions, but at the moment they're unanswerable, and short of digging up the graveyard, which is in current use, I can't see how we're going to, um, how we're going to resolve that. It's a research question for the future. 
Um, John, the Byzantine coppers, um, yes, we are doing our best to try and find parallels for that in the 6th or 7th century context in Eastern England. Can't find any yet. Um, I'm not suggesting that these are circulating as part of a monetized economy. I'm suggesting they're somehow coming in on the back of directed mercantile trade from the Mediterranean and that they're like they're a lost byproduct of <coughs> trade which is taking place there. And if there is a monetization at this time, it's to do with the gold coinage at a high and quite um, exclusive social level. Explaining them in any greater detail than that at the moment, given that this is a unique assemblage for Eastern England, is going to be difficult. But Sam Moorhead will be on it. Can I just add to that? Sorry. Can I add to that, that actually in conversation with Sam, he says that there are more of them around than we think in all parts of Britain but that they simply have been written off as not genuine archaeological finds in the past. And also that they have a strongly coastal distribution everywhere. Say except and look forward to it. Any guidance, any guidance gratefully accepted. The one thing I won't accept is that these are garden finds thrown away by returning servicemen from the First World War. Yeah, in, indeed, but, they, but in this case, they threw them onto an otherwise unknown site that was absolutely stuffed with contemporary goodies from other parts of the world, and they only took. Um, <coughs> excuse me, they only took issues of a sort of 30 year uh, period from Eastern Mediterranean. So I, I, I find it difficult to accept that they are their goal. Well, that's because after Heraclius there's a terrific decline in the availability of Byzantine and bronze coins. I find you get the anonymous followings in the 8th century. I hear what you're saying, John, but the. I hear what you're saying, and you don't believe it. I <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> can go on a um, I should like to thank you both very much indeed. I found it an immensely stimulating um, lecture, and uh, I'm sure we, sure we all did. Uh, I think it's really great that we have um, talks like this where the evidence is so fresh. I certainly didn't know very much about this site, and I think that's exactly what we should be having here. New evidence fresh from the field. Uh, and. Uh, that um, can stimulate debate, which is which is excellent, and I'm very glad you came. So I was saying, new evidence fresh from the field in excavations found in Bath Society. Well, <laughs> I was going. To, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, and um, I think what you've done is, I, I, I think it's great that you set it in context because I do get very frustrated by archaeological lectures which focus on the site, and you've given us a real feeling. Of, of the, the context of this, both in terms of, um, of England and, in, in a, indeed, in a wider um, socio-economic network. So I found that really very uh, encouraging and very interesting. And uh, despite the fact you, um, a lot of what you're talking about is very theoretical, we also had um, metal detecting at Glastonbury. So, you know, I like the fact you brought it alive for us. I like the thought of all those paddocks and fairs. Um, I think there's a lot to admire in this project in the way that you've really teased out all this evidence through um, a variety of different techniques used in a very sort of logical fashion. My, um, some of my earliest archaeology was in Norfolk and I remember in the early 70s Tony Gregory instituting the whole business about working with metal detectors and I think this is a really great example of partnership. Um, you know, clearly you've got a lot of people involved in this project both in terms of professionals and uh, volunteers, uh, and, and, indeed, and indeed metal detectors, which is, this is terrific. Um, and, uh, and also, as you say, the funding from the Society of Antiquities, you've clearly got a lot of other funders involved, and I think it's a really great example um, of an archaeological project that's produced really interesting new evidence using a battery of different funding, different people, different techniques, and um, yeah, I really 
commend you for, for the work you've done. Thank you very much indeed.